So welcome to this video where we'll talk about passively investing in small business acquisitions. You know, it's the idea of not wanting to be involved in the day-to-day -day operations of a business, but still wanting to help businesses, small businesses, private businesses. Sounds pretty exciting, right? Well, that's gonna be our focus today. How can you find great small business acquisitions to passively invest into while someone else is operating it for you? And to start with, let me ask you this. Why start a business when you can buy one, right? Look, in the end of the day, we're all about investing in entrepreneurs who prefer acquiring an existing business rather than starting one from scratch. That's the idea of this all training. It's the idea of going and buying something existing and established that already have revenues and team and great products versus startups. Because imagine this, a small profitable business with customers, with brand awareness, with employees, with revenues, with profits, everything that a startup doesn't have. Plus, it's in an established market. So there's no worrying about competition or creating a market from scratch. Sounds like a magical recipe, doesn't it? And look, many of these businesses have been around for decades and they could use a fresh approach from the next generation of entrepreneurs that are looking to buy and operate those businesses. And you can invest in those entrepreneurs. Like think about the opportunities in small companies that have outdated systems or ineffective marketing strategies. A lot of those businesses are being owned by baby boomers that don't even have access or understanding of technology. And when you find a young entrepreneur looking to buy them and you passively invest in them, it can create a massive opportunity. And instead of building everything from the ground up, you can start by focusing on improving an already successful enterprise, right? Your journey begins with activities like managing, innovating, and growing the company from day one instead of coming up with unique ideas that might or might not work. Doesn't that sound better than trying to find product market fit and managing a cash flow, negative burn rate or whatnot while trying to raise capital? Well, that's the life of most startups. They just try and reinvent the wheel and coming up with ideas and try to raise capital and most of them fail. So the idea is to find someone alongside you that will operate it for you and will do most of the day-to-day -day work, including the pre-deal work, like finding a deal, like the person who's negotiating the deal for you, and also the person who will take the loan, the bank loan guarantee, alongside your equity investment that isn't guaranteed, right? We also call the person that you'll invest in the sponsor or the search fund entrepreneur, or just basically the entrepreneur. Now, I don't know if you know that, but there are around 500,000 small businesses that are being acquired every single year. And what they're basically doing, the people who are buying it, the passive investors or the active operators, they're skipping the startup phase, right? You can call them acquisition entrepreneurs. And they are unlocking trillions in value. And I'll tell you in a second why and how that looks like. And you might think that those high profile, fast growing tech companies out there are the ones driving the economy and creating new jobs. Sure, they do drive trends by betting big on especially emerging markets. But guess what? That's not where the real growth comes from. In fact, in 1979, economist David Birch made an eye-opening discovery, the idea that small businesses are actually responsible for creating the majority of new jobs. And you know where we find these job creators? You don't find them on Wall Street or Main Street. You find them in the middle market, the boring space, all right? So next time you think about entrepreneurship, remember that sometimes the most exciting opportunities can be found in those boring spaces. And I want us to explore those together. And I want you to understand how having access to those small, boring businesses in the end of the day is responsible for most of the growth of our economy. So if your goal is to save jobs, to create jobs, to help your community by passively investing in those businesses, this is your opportunity because you're going to see exactly what that looks like. And the opportunity starts with what we call the $10 trillion tsunami. Because I don't know if you know that, but the baby boomer generation owns more businesses than any other generation in history. Did you know that? Like we're talking about 12 million small businesses or 43% of all small businesses in the country, in the US, that are being owned by baby boomers. And guess what? At this point, they're retiring at a rate of about 11,000 each day. Between 2013 and 2029, Nearly 77 million people, around 20% of the US population, are expected to retire. That means that an estimated $10 trillion in existing business value will need to change hands. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? Now, those baby boomers, those boomers are already selling their successful businesses at a record rate. It creates an amazing opportunity for acquisition entrepreneurs to go out there, buy, grow, 
run and innovate those boring businesses from day one with the stability that a startup often lack, right? So we're really about to witness a massive buyer's market like never before. And again, you don't need to be the person who's operating the day to day. You can be the passive investors putting capital in a lot of entrepreneurs who prefer to buy a business instead of starting from some scratch. That's the idea here. So let's talk for a second about what makes a good investment, right? And it's a very good question. And entire industries have been built around investing in alternative assets like startups and existing businesses. And, you know, we can talk about a lot of different asset classes, but think venture capital, private equity and real estate investing. The key there is using leverage along with an initial equity investment to acquire an asset. That's what you see in all of those alternative assets, talking private equity, if it's businesses or real estate, right? When considering acquisitions and an investment, business acquisitions, you want to keep those things in mind as well, right? And you also want to keep fundamentals like the idea of return on investment, of margin of safety, of understanding upside potential of an investment. And that's some of the things that we're going to dive into, right? So it's the world of business acquisitions combined with the world of just investing in general, right? So let's go through some of those terms to understand how we can view them generally and then how you can view them compare to small business acquisition investment. So starting with return on investment, let's talk about ROI, right? Return on investment. So let's say, imagine you have 100 bucks, $100 in an asset, and it generates $6 back to you every year. What that means, it means that you have 6% ROI every year, right? Pretty straightforward. Now, let's say that you sell the assets after seven years for 120 bucks. During those seven years, what did you just did? So you made $6 per year, totally in of $42 dollars right and the 20 dollar increase in value from selling the asset as well and you made 62 dollar on your 100 bucks investment over seven years so if you calculate it that's an 8.9 percent annual return simple right so let's break it down even further the six dollar per year received is called cash flow the amount of cash coming back to you as the asset owner on an ongoing basis, right? You deserve that as part of the investment. When you sold the assets for 120 bucks, its value increased by $20, basically during the seven years, the appreciation, right? It's very much a real estate term, appreciation. The value of the asset is going up. So when evaluating a potential acquisition, cash flow is often what sets the value to start with and the sales price. And that's what drives the valuation and is ultimately what you're paying for. So essentially, you're buying an asset that provides cash flow. Doesn't matter if it's real estate or business, right? And then the next question is, how much cash flow should a certain investment return? Well, the answer lies in the risk profile of the investment. So how do you make a smart investment decision? Well, it depends. So that leads me to the idea of risk of investment, right? So the way to look at it is to imagine a scale of investments from the safest to the riskiest. So on one hand, you have, let's say, US-backed treasury bonds. They're considered super safe, right? Let's say, just to keep the number simple, that you're generating 3% on invested capital, invested capital in, in bonds, right? Treasury bonds. On the other hand, you have startups. They're like very risky, quite risky with a need for high returns to compensate for that risk, right? That's why you see VCs investing in 10 companies and expecting just one to succeed, basically. But they expect that that one will make the returns that they expect from all of them. So startups, bonds, where do small businesses fit in? So they're in the middle, right? They're safer than startups, but they're not as secured as US-backed securities. And again, some people would say otherwise at this point with the economy situation. But the idea is also to understand that the larger a company is, the safer it's considered. That's why small companies with under 5 million revenue, let's say, can sell for two to three times their cash flow, while big companies, so publicly traded companies, they trade at much higher price to earnings ratio. So the bigger the business is, the more it's considered as safe. You can take a look at companies like Apple, right? You can go and buy their stock for, again, depends on when you're checking out, for let's say 18 to 25 times their earnings, their yearly earnings. But for a small company with under 5 million in revenue, you can expect to pay around two to five times the total annual cash flow to the owner. Most transactions, they settle at approximately three to four, five times yearly earnings. And again, it depends on the deal, depends on the motivation of the seller and many other factors. But that just, again, to keep the numbers simple and understand the difference between big businesses and small businesses. Now, I also want you to think about this. 
what kind of an investment are you willing to make considering the risks and returns, right? Like, are you excited about the potential of small businesses in general? Can you see the idea that you have an amazing upside because there's so many more things you can do? Like if you're going to invest in Apple, there's only so much more upside that the company like Apple might have at this point because they're so big already. When you go and find a business that is still small but have enough revenues and credibility, the upside is pretty much unlimited if you catch them the right time. But at the same time, they're not as risky as startups that's most likely going to fail. Next, I want you to understand what is expected returns, right? So look, when you talk to professional investors, they usually aim to beat the market's average, which is, let's say, 8% annual ROI. In real estate, there's a term that's called uh, cap rate, if you heard about. So it's basically the rent paid to the owner compared to the property's purchase price. So in real estate, cap rates can vary between 4 and 12%, depending on the tenant risk and a few other factors. Forbes even mentioned that an average cap rate for real estate portfolio should be around 9%, right? But guess what? For small businesses, the cap rate can be open 24%. That's more than double a comparable real estate investment, right? And we'll show you some examples. But it's something that most people just are not aware of and don't know that the potential to those, and again, obviously nothing is guaranteed, but trust me, I've seen deals with much higher return than 24. Now, this investment model, it's it's nothing new, right? It's pretty much the driving force behind the entire private equity industry. But don't you think it would make sense to apply this model to better entrepreneurship? So it's pretty much bored from pre PE, from private equity firms, right? So you see a lot of acquisitions of entrepreneurs nowadays, they're smart. And I've worked with a lot of them. They bored the business model of private equity firm, basically, instead of venture capital, right? Which is much more riskier. But at the same time, you want to be warned because you need to understand that they take a lot of debt, which can be risky because if things go wrong, you can end up bankrupt and heartbroken, right? So it's crucial to understand the risks. And if the entrepreneur is taking the risk on himself and you put in the money, there's a balance. So how risky is small business acquisition and how can you ensure a good return on investment ROI, right? And here you need to understand that risk is relative in the end of the day, right? The risk return spectrum says that the more risk you take, the greater the return should be. Right? It's pretty common sense. Warren Buffett, one of the obviously world as more successful investors, follow a strategy called value investing. And it's all about the idea of going out there, finding a the true value of a company, which isn't an exact number, but rather kind of like a subjective concept. But it's the idea of, okay, let's figure out what's the value of the company in a subjective way, or hopefully not so subjective. So the question then comes, okay, let's say you find companies, how do you really find the value of the company? Well, you can start by estimating the liquidation value, right? What's the liquidation value of the business, assuming worst case scenario? Then you can consider other additional factors like competitive advantage, like brand awareness, um, and also future cash flows. Right? So if you look at Warren Buffett, he sticks to what he knows, to sectors that he knows. He focuses on tangible assets and earnings, and he buys usually the business when the price is favorable compared to the intrinsic value of the business. And for him, this approach creates a margin of safety as an investor. So to understand Warren Buffett, we need to take a trip back to uh, 1934 with Benjamin uh, Graham, one of the pioneers of value investing. And he introduced the term margin of safety. Right? And it's the idea, it's all about having that built-in cushion to protect you from risk. So the idea is that when considering a small business acquisition or investing in an acquisition, you need to remember to weight the risk and rewards carefully. And always just have this idea of margin of safety in mind. Right? Like what's your worst case downside compared to your upside? And this is some of the things you want to look into when you're starting to look at deals. Right? So let's talk about this idea of margin of safety a bit more. When an investor buys a stock at um, a price, let's say, way below its actual worth, he's basically limiting his risk. Right? And that's the idea that Warren Buffett and his partner Charlie Munger have really made famous. Because by focusing on this margin of safety, they've achieved incredible results. It's basically an asymmetric risk with minimum downside and mostly upside. Question then is, okay, with all of those things, how does this apply to buying small businesses, right? To investing in small businesses passively? Well, the way that I see that, I think that the private market for small businesses is already trading around their true value. Like it's pretty cheap if you buy a business for three times profit. And maybe it's because buyers can't always find the right sellers or because private companies aren't easy to trade. But likely that the prices are just right for buyers to make a decent return at this point. And things might change and you see private equity firms going for small businesses. But for right now, I feel like price is pretty fair. Like if you buy in businesses for four times earnings, you can get 25% and that's before you assume any leverage and loans. All right, so let's continue to explore it. Let's compare the risks of starting the business versus acquiring one. Think about it this way. The, the average startup begins with 50,000 
on average, $50,000 and has 90% chance of failing. Venture backed companies even, they receive around 40 million and still have 70, 80% chance of failing, right? Like you see SoftBank investing millions of dollars in companies and they still, they still fail. It's for a different reason, but still. But then if you look at acquisition entrepreneurship, most small businesses sell for under 1 million, right? Under $1 million. And according to the SBA, the Small Business Administration, they're doing most of those loans for acquisitions. Only 2% of small business loans default, which is pretty insane, which means that if you acquire a business for a million dollars, there's only a two chance percentage chance of failure. It means 98% success rate. So you should say these differences because small businesses are valued more accurately than startups with no revenues. Maybe, you know, infrastructure of earnings could be. But when it comes to the margin of safety, acquiring a small business seems just, I think, pretty smart move when you understand that your downside is only 2%, assuming that you look at the data from the SBA, from the small administration guys, right? Pretty unique opportunity. So it's an asymmetric investment, right? So let's really understand what's up here, right? When you hear people like Warren Buffett, they know the importance of margin of safety. It's crucial for people like those, and those are the best, right? So when buying a company, the safety margin is built in already because you're investing based on real earnings and your default rate because of that is minimal if you're buying the right company, especially. So imagine that a company is selling, let's say at four times of its earnings, right? So it pretty much means that in just four years, the investor get their money back. Compared this to the 25% of chance of venture capital investment paying off at all, pretty crazy, right? And this is why buying a business might be the secret to entrepreneurial investing in success that most people just never heard about yet. It just reduces a lot of risk. And if you can find those people that are looking to operate those acquisitions and you can passively invest in them, you'll have an opportunity to get great returns, right? But then the question is, cool, what's the cost of entry, right? Because the cost of entering this type of investment is usually, to be honest, not much higher than starting a company from scratch. And the reason for that is thanks to the opportunities to raise debt financing options that we have, right? Plus, I mean, entrepreneurs can then use their skills to grow their revenues and increase earnings, like we said, right? Because they can then take advantage of both cash flow and appreciation for the business. It's a pretty unique opportunity, especially if you find a good operator, you just put in the money. It's a very unique opportunity to see a great upside with minimum downside. And think about it, like in real estate, for example, there's not much you can do to increase the value other than appreciation, right? But in business, it's called building value. And that's where entrepreneurs have the upper hand. Like when you buy a business and grow it, you're increasing cash flow and the overall value of your assets, giving you a powerful wealth building tool. Because there's so many things you can do, like better marketing, better sales, hiring better talented people, building better processes and accountability and systems and whatnot that most small businesses just lack. Even just bringing discipline to a business can change a small business. So with business acquisitions, you can invest in something you either you passionate about or love, you can pay yourself, you can grow a team or your operator can grow a team and you can reinvest things back if needed. And the best part is your operator can even choose to grow the business further through additional acquisitions. How? By funding them entirely through the cash flow of the business and additional debt financing if needed. Of course, you don't want to put too much stress, but that's the power of having a value creation on your side. Again, the upside is unlimited in business. By going out there and buying more companies, you increase the overall value, you merge, you create synergies, so many things you can do, right? So I'm just curious, so far, what do you think about this acquisition? And overall, looking at your entrepreneurial world from that view. So, so far, I know we mixed a lot of things, um, mostly talked passive investments, maybe being active. I think it's very important for you to understand what kind of an investor or entrepreneur you are, right? For you personally, ask yourself, like, do you prefer hands-on involvement or maybe you prefer more of a passive role? Because understanding your own investment style will help you determine if this model is perfect match for you or not, right? So really ask yourself, do you prefer to be passive, put more money than time, or you prefer to be active, put more time than money? And then ideally find what fits for you. You want to be a passive investor and you want to be the operators doing the work and someone else maybe putting the money. Next, we want to explore deal flow, right? So the question is, okay, let's say you put in the money or your operator, how, how do you find those opportunities, right? How do you find those businesses that we talked about? Well, we're going to discuss some tips and tricks to help you find those deals. And the, the thing is that once you've found an opportunity, the real question is how do you make a decision, right? How do you evaluate a company as maybe also the operator 
it's really crucial to ensure that you're making a smart investment. And we're going to break those things down as we go to really help you make an informed decision. If we'll have time, we're also going to talk about managing multiple investments. So we're kind of like building a portfolio management structure, right? And we'll discuss about all those things and how to balance your investments and how to make the most out of your acquisitions compared to your as their asset allocations and portfolio approach. And the idea is that I know a lot of passive investors are asking themselves, okay, can I even add value to my investment? Well, the, the answer is yes, you can. As a passive investor, you can still make a significant impact on the business. Um, I'll even show you how to support your investments and your operators as you grow and as you help them grow with your experience and without necessarily being there in the day to day. All right. So again, just make a decision. Do you want to put the money or do you want to put the time? If you can't do both, it's going to be very difficult for you to be involved. All right. So start to think about what would be your ideal scenario. All right. So next, let's just discuss in general on different asset classes a bit more and how can one invest his money, right? And, and the, the way we can do this, like picture this, imagine that you're looking for a solid investment with a great return, right? And you know, there are a few options out there, like savings, like money markets, like treasuries, like we said, so might give you 3% or both. Real estate or REITs could give you maybe 10, 11%. And the S&P and other indexes average at around 8%, let's say. I wanna double click on it and get back to what we said with investing in small business acquisitions in small and medium enterprises can give you 20, 30% return on your investment. Right, so it's a very unique opportunity to remember small businesses because most people don't even know that it's possible, don't know the process. They're not as accessible to others. They provide a great opportunity if you can access those deals somehow. But you also need to remember that when you're looking at those alternative asset classes, you'll need a long-term view. Like I suggest you to have at least five to 10 years view, some kind of a willingness to fail. And also the, the idea and understanding that if you're gonna be the passive investor, you're gonna work with strong personalities, like with entrepreneurs that are gonna be very opinionated, all right? So you gotta have the ability to take a leap of faith. You're also probably gonna need to be, uh, not probably, you need to be accredited investor if you wanna be a major investor, right? And there are some options to invest if you're non-accredited, but let's assume that for now you need to be an accredited investor. So you've got to be someone with money. There are different terms to become an accredited. We might explore that in a bit. But first I want to go through understanding um, what is your motivation to get into it in the first place. And I believe that your motivation should be non-financial motivation as well. Like the idea of you wanting to support small businesses. Uh, maybe you like the idea of making bets in people you believe in. Maybe you like the idea of surrounding yourself with driven, high-performance entrepreneurs. All of those could be good reasons, but let's make sure that you find the right reason for you. Next, I want you to ask yourself like, what's your commitment level, right? Like, are you ready to invest in one deal, in 10 deals, right? And again, I think having a long-term commitment and a portfolio approach is probably best. So you don't give up if let's say the first deal is not as successful as you want it to be, right? So for example, if you have 500,000 to invest, maybe put it in five to 10 deals with 50 to 100,000 check per deal. Then you can explore yourself, build a portfolio and really learn from each of those. So I'm curious for you personally, can you imagine the idea and the rewards even investing in small business acquisitions and working with ambitious entrepreneurs that will operate it for you, right? Let me know your thoughts because if you don't have this ambitious of supporting entrepreneurs or at least following um, an asset that isn't as liquid, like if you're investing in small business acquisitions, you can access the capital right away, like a public stock, right? That's why you can also expect potential higher returns because it's more, it's less liquid. It's another something to consider. Next, I want to talk about the idea of you bringing something to the table. So ask yourself, what can you bring to the table when it comes to a deal, right? And don't get me wrong, your value add might be more than just money, right? It could be your business or industry experience, your network, or even your maybe technology expertise, whatever it is for you. But whatever that is, when you position yourself as an investor, it's also gonna allow you to potentially have a better chance of getting the operator to work with you versus someone else with no experience, right? So assuming that you have that, then let's talk about finding the right deals. So, and it can be tricky in the private space. Why? Because Unlike public companies, there's no one-stop shop for small business acquisitions, right? That's where actually our platform acquisition.com come in. Like we, our goal is to provide a curated selection of deals for our syndicate members because we look at tons of deals, right? But if you want to do and find those deals on your own, let me give you some tips, right? So some of the things you can do to find those deals and opportunities and operators is first of all, you can attend conferences and events. You can find demo days, investment days, syndication days, use social media to find operators with the groups, uh, join other syndications. And of course, just network however you can. Some people send letters, LinkedIn messages, cold emails, whatever you can do to get yourself in the conversation of finding the deals that you want. And you wanna keep in mind that finding the perfect deal in the end of the day, a lot of it comes down to numbers game, plus knowing how to position yourself. So if you can position yourself as someone with expertise, more than just money, it can give you 
another way to get in the door. Then you need to remember and understand that you'll need to review many companies before finding the right one. So it's really time to roll up your sleeves and get ready to dive into as many deals as possible, right? Because the best deals will come to you from different um, channels. Like you never know when the deal, the best deal is going to come to you. So you always want to be talking about what you're doing and what you're looking to invest in and change your conversations around it. Go out there and find people and tell them what you're doing. Tell them what you're looking to invest in and tell them you're looking to invest in small businesses. Then after you find them, it's time to vet the deals, right? So the idea is, and the question is like what you should look for when it comes to having the conversations with, let's assume that you have an operator looking to buy, then you're going to have a first meeting with him, right? So I think it's really important to imagine that you're on a quest to find the next superstar to operate the business that you want to invest in. So it's really essential to pay attention to every detail when you're talking to them. Right? When you're talking to an operator, ask yourself, is that the person that I see myself putting money into? Can I trust him? Is he committed? Is he going to do the work? Do you have any experience in the sector? Like, what do I know about him? And you also never want to underestimate anyone because you don't know what that person might create. You never know who the next superstar might be until they've had few years usually to operate the business. So do your homework by researching the operator, the company, the competitors, the market in general. The more you know about the operator, about the opportunity, about the market, about the company, the better. So assuming you find some deals or you find an operator that have a deal for him and is looking for an investor, you know, I want you to imagine yourself that you're having a meeting with him. Like, set some kind of rules, right? Have a list of questions prepared. Come to him prepared with a question. Make sure to give, I like to give time limits on calls with potential investment, right? Showing that you respect each other's time. Be polite, listen carefully, take notes. And most importantly, when you work with operators, be clear on next steps. Like don't keep things, you know, in a gray zone. Like make sure everyone knows what the next steps are and what is expected from you or from the operator. And at the same time, as you analyze those potential investments, you want to consider obviously the financials of the business, the team's experience or the operator experience, their growth plan, um, the competition, right? And also you want to watch out for red flags, right? So for example, if someone tell you, hey, we have no competition or if the entrepreneur um, is constantly like argumentative, that's a warning sign, right? If you're always trying to argue or whatnot, I'm not sure I want to work with those people. And of course, a lack of market data from the entrepreneur is always concerning. Like you want to ask yourself, did that person did he do his homework? If not, then how can you trust him and put the money with him? Right? So always asking a lot of questions is very important. Now, I really think that the most important thing you want to look for in potential investment in the small business space is the person, is the person you're investing in. So always ask yourself, do I see myself working with that person, with that character? So let's go through a checklist of some of the qualities that you can look for in an operator that you'll invest in. Right? So first of all, I would say look for passion. Right, look for someone who's super passionate about the idea and maybe someone who's even passionate about just solving problems in general. Ideally, someone who want to make an impact, someone who's always striving for excellence and not just for money, someone who's driven, who got integrity, uh, ideally got sector experience, so he knows something about the space. If he got a business experience, either um, their own or someone they worked with or for, um, look for leadership, right? Look for their temperament. Like I want it to be... Kind of like even, right? If he's going to be an entrepreneur, you probably you want to probably look for frugality, uh, management experience, operating knowledge, commitment, long-term view, flexibility, excellent communication. The best entrepreneurs also always have strategic thinking, right? Their interpersonal and intellectual skills. They have industry understanding and also the idea to be able to deal with ambiguity, right? They should be tenacious, organized, focused, uh, achievement-oriented, thick-skinned risk tolerant, self-confident, um, creative, optimistic, assertive, decisive, you know, maybe even perfectionist. All those things I want to constantly look into. You got that or not? You might need to talk to hundreds of entrepreneurs before getting a gut feeling about who to invest with. But in the end of the day, it's numbers game and constantly learning and becoming better. Like for example, in our syndication, we do all the due diligence for investors. Yes, we take a percentage of the carry, but we save a lot of time for investors. So instead of doing everything yourself, you can enjoy these benefits with us, right? You can access to unique deals after we filter thousands of them, right? Plus at the same time, you get a peek behind the scenes of our process and also connection with the community of like-minded investors, which I know a lot of people are really looking for, right? At some point in life, we always want to find a community of like-minded people. 
And with our syndications, we also have kind of like the passive involvement, but getting the quarterly updates from those companies. So next, let's talk about analyzing those deals, right? So let's say we find operators, they send us some deals. How do we analyze them ourselves? So first of all, I want to look for innovative product, um, some kind of understanding of what's their market share or is there any path for dominant in the market share? Ideally, I want to see if they can be the winner in their category, right? Obviously, profitable business or at least profitable business model. If it's an acquisition, I want it to be profitable. Um, if it's an acquisition of a company that is established, of course. I'll probably want to understand a bit about the TAM or what we call total addressable market. Um, I want to understand if it's an essential product, right? So that's kind of like something interesting, like that is good. I want to understand if they have a global reach, understand the sector trends, understand the risks for the business, understand what's the company culture with the existing employees. I want to obviously look at the valuation, like how much they want for the business. And obviously is it premium valuations we need to pay for or it's a fair value. I want to search maybe if there's a brand loyalty, right? So for example, brand loyalty means that there are successful companies that also bring in repeat customers again and again. That's for me, brand loyalty, like customers that are coming back. There's a retention of clients. I want to understand if there's a key person risk. So are there any employees, customers, management, suppliers that the business is highly dependent on? I want to understand if the, there's like, if the business is customer focused, like do they care about their customer? If they're long-term focused, do they care about their long-term, like their transformational relationship and not just transitional one-time thing? and recurring revenue. So if it's an amazing brand, clients are coming back, I wanna see some recurring revenue. I wanna see clients that are staying and buying the service again and again, because that brings me confidence when I look at the deals. And remember the beauty with small businesses is that the bigger the business gets, the more it's usually worth over time. So we look to buy businesses that are being valued at two to five times multiples of EBITDA or the pre-tax profit. The same business when it grows can be valued to 10, 15, 20 times EBITDA, right? It's pretty unique opportunity in the, the the way that the markets stack it up it's pretty much private equity firms they target larger companies with usually over 2 million in profits and pay up to 10 times multiples of that public markets they buy and pay 5 to 20 times EBITDA or pre-tax profits it depends on the investment type and size and market of course so again the idea with what we're doing with small businesses is we, we buy businesses at 2 to 5 times EBITDA and then we aim to grow them and either flip them to private equity firms or IPO and take it public and immediately increasing the valuation to 10, 20 times. That's the fascinating part of this world, right? And I hope it makes you understand what's the potential that lies in small business acquisition, right? Because you buy them small, the upside is pretty much unlimited. And as you grow, you play the multiple games and the multiple games can save you years of acceleration in your appreciation of value and your overall net worth as an investor. So when we invest in small business acquisitions, the idea here is that we basically invest in the early stages of buying a private business, right? With the ultimate goal of making a profit, of course. Typically, these businesses are over like we want to see them at least three exist for three years. We want to make sure that they already achieved product market fit. We want to make sure that they are being run or sold by motivated sellers, which allow us to buy at a discount compared to the public market businesses. And then after we invest, the main objective is obviously to watch the company grow, right? And eventually they're being acquired by a larger company or going public, doing an IPO. This is known as what we call the exit, right? When, when there's the exit, that's where you can cash out your shares and reap the rewards as an investor. And if the company is sustainable and profitable, you might even enjoy dividends or cash flow along the way. And maybe you don't even need to sell it, right? You just continue to run it forever and get great returns on a yearly basis, kind of like a real estate that you hold forever. So the idea is that public companies often trade at a premium. The idea is that we buy them small, private, and we ride the upside as they grow and approach premium valuations. We buy them at two, three, five times multiples of profits. We take the time, we are patient, we let the operator run it, and then they grow and over time being valued at five, 10, 20 times. When it comes to the investment objectives and potential aims, like for example, if we aim for a target rate, rate return of over 20% per year with let's say three to five years, a timeline on, on an investment, it really allows us time for going out there and doing more acquisitions of companies and doing more organic growth activities, right? And then the exit could be a sell to another company in the industry. A sell could be um, to a related industry company or to any new investor group, right? Mostly private equity firms are looking to buy those at two to five time multiples. I mean, we buy them at two to five and sell them for 10 plus ideally. Next, let's talk about creating your own investing principles. So it's really essential that when you're looking to invest in any other class, any asset class, right? It's essential to focus on a few key aspects. 
First of all, we always want to think about minimizing risk and protecting your principal, right? Protecting the money is number one. We, look, we want to look for amazing opportunities with high potential returns. We want to look for something that have potentially great exit strategy with the possibility of dividends while holding on to the investment. If we have all those things at the same time, for me, it's a very good opportunity. And of course, you need some kind of a solid thesis or strategy around the investment or see your operator coming up with a great strategy and then you make a decision if you want to put money in him or not. You want to find or get your operator to find ideally someone who's motivated to sell, ideally businesses with growth potential and operators, like we said, with strong character and support. Right now, so might ask, okay, so why not just invest money just in public companies like Tesla and Google? Well, the thing is that when a company is already well established, the valuation is high, which means lower returns for you. Right? There's only so much that a company like Google can go up from here. They're already massive. So who can invest in private acquisitions and rollups, right? So in the US, you need to be an accredited investor. According to the SEC, it means that you've earned over 200,000 or 300,000 with your spouse um, in the last two years, right? And you expect the same for the current year. So it's either this or you have a net worth over 1 million, excluding your primary residence. To go and do all of this on your own, you'll need some mix of money, time, network, expertise. You don't need them all, but the best investors possess, let's say, at least four qualities, all right? So first of all, is the ability to write a check, so being the money. Um, second of all, it's the ability or time to support CEOs, the operators with critical issues. Next one is a network to provide valuable introductions for the business and um, some kind of expertise to offer actionable advice that saves time to the operator or saves time or prevent mistakes. And as a bonus, I found that the best investors, they really enjoy meeting and chatting with lots of CEOs until they find the perfect match. So you need to ask yourself, are you interested or looking or can be that person to go out there and have so many conversations with the operator or just go and invest in the syndications or someone else who's doing it for you, all right? Now think about it. Next, let me tell you a secret um, to become a successful investor in business acquisitions without breaking a sweat. And the way to position it is, I'll ask you like, what, what if I told you that you can invest in 10 businesses in the next 30 days without having to find them on your own, without having to analyze them on your own, all of that pretty much from the comfort of your own home. And it might sound too good to be true after all we went through, the way to do that is through syndication. So let me introduce you to syndication. Syndicates are a way of pulling money together from a group of people for a common goal. It's something you really need to be aware of. But instead of you doing all the work, someone else with more experience finds the best deals and operates for you. That's the magic of syndicates. Then we have carried interest, right? So carried interest, it's the share of profits that goes to the fund manager for taking the risk and effort. You'll be giving up 20% of the return. On average, it depends on the deal, but considering the convenience, it's a fair trade. So with most syndications, there is a carried interest. Carried interest goes to the fund manager, right? So that's what, if you heard about carry or carried interest, that's where um, you're gonna come across more of those because you put in the money, you're doing none of the work, someone else is doing the work for you and you're paying a percentage from the profits. And in the end of the day, entrepreneurs, also love syndicates. Why? Because it means that they only need one signature from the syndicate lead, making future deals much easier. So instead of having hundreds of investors, the entrepreneur is only talking to the leader of the syndicates, which makes the communication much easier. As a syndicate member, you get to invest in great deals, right? In established acquisitions. You work with established syndicate leaders that have hopefully vetted deals. And remember, you don't have to say yes to every deal. You can always opt out, but the syndicate leader will send you deals. You will look at all the deals, deals that you like, you can invest in. If you don't have, don't like, you don't have to. The benefit of starting your investing adventure with syndicates are huge because you can invest while working at your current job or running your current business or doing whatever you need, or even in, you know, you can stay at home, being in your underwear in investment companies. Syndicates require very little paperwork. And you don't need to take any meetings with entrepreneurs or do due diligence or find the deals on your own and talk to hundreds of them. The syndicate lead is doing all of that. He's out there finding deals, filtering deals, analyzing deals and doing all of that work and taking a percentage from the profits. To get into most syndicates, like I said, you probably need to be an accredited investor in the US and have um, basically wire money to the syndicate leader. And that's it. When you're doing that, 
you can make the magic happen and invest in small business acquisitions. Now, if you're thinking, okay, all this idea of investing in small business sounds interesting. I like the idea that some syndicates might do a lot of their work for me. Then you might be thinking, okay, so how much should I invest or how much like one should invest in those things? Well, you want to think of it, I think like poker, it's very good analogy. So you wouldn't put all your chips on the table at once, right? Because losing everything is a real risk. Instead, you can ask yourself a few questions like, for example, will you need the cash in the next three years or can you wait? Because with small business acquisitions, you need to wait. You don't have access to liquidity right away. What about accessing, like, can you access more cash or have ongoing cash flow in addition to your investments, right? To pay your own ongoing bills. Also ask yourself, like, how would you feel if you lost 100% or 50% of the invested money? It's a small risk, but good to consider, right? Because like we said, there's only 2% of default rate of failure rate with small business loans with SBA. But having that mindset of, okay, I might lose it all, could be a good way of looking at investments sometimes, especially if it's an alternative asset like small business acquisitions. I also want you to understand uh, next what it looks like to talk to the entrepreneurs doing deals, right? So just so you know, most of those meetings with entrepreneurs, the operators, like you want to set aside at least an hour to show that you're serious as the investor and you probably want to let the entrepreneur talk until they're tired, right? And you want to hear everything they have to say. So if you are the leader of those investments, you need to talk to many of those and you need to ask yourself, do you have the time to do that, right? And then after you're talking to each founder and entrepreneur, you probably want to ask yourself, okay, why this entrepreneur, first of all, chose this business compared like to any other business he could have bought? How committed is this entrepreneur? What are their chances of success in this business and maybe in life in general? And what does winning look like in terms of revenue and your return as an investor? So you either do all of those conversations yourself or again, you find a syndicate and you invest through the syndicate. Later, when you go deeper into due diligence, you wanna ask some more questions, right? And again, through the syndicate or on your own deals, you wanna check the pitch deck. So most entrepreneurs, when they're trying to raise capital, they will create a pitch deck. In that pitch deck, you want to see things like, what's the competition like? How does the business make money? How much do they charge customers? What's the average customer spending, right? You want to learn as much as possible about the business to see if the business is good. What are the top three reasons why the business might fail? Like start to think about those things. Okay, what's the downside? Why the business is good? What's the mode? How this business is unique compared to others in the space? Why this entrepreneur can add value to this business versus not? Those are questions you want to ask yourself. Next, let's move to uh, what we call monthly updates. So when you're investing in a business, usually you want to get updates from the entrepreneur, right? As an investor, I want to know what's up. So if a company isn't sending me updates, um, it's a sign that it's probably not going really well, right? Because no news isn't good news. See what I mean? So you always want to have constant access to dialogue with the entrepreneur and ask about any problems. In our syndicate, we have weekly calls with the entrepreneurs, information rights access, and we also provide most of our entrepreneurs that we invest with, we provide C-suite operational support, like fractional support to their business to make sure that everything runs smoothly. So we support them in sales, marketing, operations, finance, HR, everything to make sure that if we're investing, we're protecting our investors' money by supporting the entrepreneur in the operations. Because as a lot of the entrepreneurs that buy businesses for the first time, it's the first time that they ever buy or run a business. So we wanna make sure they have the full ecosystem to get the support. So the idea with what we're doing is like, we wanna be the kind of like one stop, full service shop for acquisitions. We help entrepreneurs that operate. We wanna help passive investors. We wanna help scouts and brokers and banks because everyone is different. Everyone needs to think different about their goals and their lifestyle and what they wanna do. Are they younger, they're older, they're willing to pay, take more risks, less risks, they wanna play it safe or not, right? They're looking for cash flow or long-term appreciation, they're looking for tax benefits or they want massive IPO. So for you, you gotta have your strategy. What is your goal? Again, it all comes down to your vision, your outcomes, what is important to you? And I can tell you the beauty again with small businesses that there are a lot of upsides compared to other asset classes. Like for example, here, here are five reasons why I like small business compared to others. First of all, control. Like you don't want to lose money because someone else like Elon Musk, for example, does something unpredictable. Like when he went to Joe Rogan's podcast and smoked a joint, the stock went down like 20% the next day. There's growth potential. You can drive up revenue in small business. You can decrease expenses. You can improve the business. Then there's also stability, right? There's mini minimum downside, especially if you're buying recurring businesses, like recurring clients, and, and if you're taking what we call preferred shares, where you're making money before the operator makes anything. 
there are predictable valuations in small business, right? There's no market hypes, usually just multiples of EBITDA and market comparables. Like you pay fair market value with small business. You get cash flow. Like just to raise capital from banks, they require profitable business to get a loan. So you're buying into businesses with existing cash flow that can be distributed to you as passive income because the business is making money, right? You're buying something that's already established, remember. And the beauty with small business is that it can offer what we call a higher risk adjusted return. And let me explain to you what that means. Because it's not just about the potential returns, but also about considering the volatility, right? Because higher returns are great, but not if you have to suffer huge losses on the way. And the beauty is that if you're investing with someone that's taking an SBA loan, like studies shows that small businesses with SBA backing have risk profiles similar to corporate bonds, but their return profiles are like the best stocks. So you get the best of both, both worlds. Then what about things like taxes, right? Because it's not just about what you make, but what you keep. So owning a business can offer tax benefits like depreciation. And of course, remember, always consult a tax or, or legal professional. There's a lot of upsides of investing in small business, especially if there are assets involved in it as well. So there's unlimited upsides, might be real estate, depreciation you can have, have better tax scenario for you and still have amazing upsides with everything else. And, and for you to understand all those different upsides, we might need to go through what we call the understanding about time value of money and opportunity cost, right? Because the idea is that we need to understand here is that a dollar today always worth more than a dollar tomorrow because a dollar today you can invest it and earn some kind of a return right so when making decisions you want to think about what you might be missing out on if you don't choose an option you see what i mean because again a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow another thing to consider is inflation it's another factor to you want to have in mind because at this point you might be familiar with the idea that your money loses value over time due to inflation so it's essential to invest wisely and hedge against it Otherwise, that $100 that you have today will be worth much less in five years. So you want to put your money somewhere. Obviously, you have money for emergencies, but having too much cash isn't good either because the value of money is going down, especially with the economy right now. Let's go back to syndications for a second because I think it's important to clear it up. To really understand the value of syndications, it's like picture this. Imagine that you want to fly from New York to London, right? Now, you wouldn't go out get a pilot license, buy a plane, and fly yourself across the ocean, right? Instead, what do you do? You just go out there, you buy a ticket, you hop on a plane, and enjoy the ride as a passenger. That's what syndications are pretty much like. And how that works? In a syndication, like we said, investors, they're pulling their resources to acquire big assets, right? With some of them not needing to actively manage the investment because we find an operator to do that and we invest passively in him through a syndication, right? So it's like having a professional pilot and flight attendant taking care of everything while you just sit back and relax in your flight, right? You're not doing all the work. You literally just order a ticket, you pay for it, and everyone's doing everything else. Now, in a syndication, there are two main roles in a syndication that I think it's important to go into and double click here. So first we have what we call the general partners, and then we have the limited partners. Limited partners are the passive investors in the deal, right? The passive investor, their job is primarily on the front end, which means they need to learn about the deal, learn about the operator and doing some basic due diligence. They contribute capital, but not their time. Limited partners also have limited risks compared to the general partners. Now, by being a passive investor, you can also enjoy the benefit of asset appreciation and tax advantages without having to manage the investment on your own. So if you're the passive investor through a syndication, it's like flying on a private jet every day without doing all the work of being the pilot and organizing the plane, of cleaning or whatever is needed, right? So I hope you understand what that looks like because in the beginning, we talked about how you need to go out there, find deals, analyze deals, talk to the operators, right? Look at everything in the details and do hundreds of or thousands of conversations before you find one deal. Through a syndication, the syndication leader, the general partner is doing most of that. And you as the passive investor is just picking the operators after looking at deals that they already filtered through hundreds and picked the best ones. And you also need to remember that the active people in the syndication or the general partners, they bring their time, they bring their experience, they bring their network, right? to go out there, to find deals, to buy, to manage, and eventually sell the asset. 
And with a syndication, what happens? Everyone invests in an LLC, in a, a company structure, right? That is operated by the GPs, by the general partners, to then go out there and acquire the business. Next, let's talk about risk, about the risk here or just risk in general, right? So let's give you an idea. When you buy a house, for example, so usually the way it works is you put down a percentage and sign a loan. Most people take a loan when they buy a house, right? Just as a simple example. But what if things go south in a deal? You lose your down payment and you still owe the loan, right? In syndications, limited partners don't need to take on that loan on themselves. They are passively investing. So if you are the limited investor, if you're the passive investor, you invest money and that's the most you can lose. So there's no extra like liability and also your privacy is protected. On the other hand, GPs, general partners, the active operators in the fund, they have a lot of skin in the game because they're responsible for the entire loan balance, which can be quite substantial, right? Now, time is another significant factor because GPs, general partners, the active operator in the fund, they do all the work. They find deals, they arrange financing, they do the closing, the managing, the selling of the business eventually. LPs, limited partners, your time commitment is minimal right? You need to learn the basics, you need to vet the operator and the deal, and that's it. The work after investing is pretty much zero, which make it pretty scalable, right? You can go out there, keep doing whatever you're doing for a job or a business, do what you love, as time, in the end of the day, is our most limited resource, right? So as a limited partner, as a passive investor, you just look at deals real quick and you send the money. You don't need to do all the operational work, right? So I hope you start to understand what that looks like, right? GPs, active operators, they go out there, talk to hundreds of business owners, make offers, talk to banks, get the bank loan, passive investors, LPs, limited partners, they passively put the money. Now, let's dive into uh, the capital understanding on each of those deals, right? So when it comes to syndications, GPs, the general partners, should have some skin in the game, right? A lot of them might invest their money, um, some might not, and just, just put all of their time, it really depends. After all, if it's a good deal, right? If it's good enough for other people's money, it should be good enough for theirs as well, right? On the other hand, LPs, limited partners, they provide the majority of the capital needed to acquire the asset. And that's their main role in a partnership, in a fund partnership, right? So active doing the work, LPs putting the money usually. So because in the end of the day, to make those deals work, like you need a combination of few things, right? You need money, you need time, and then you need the ability and operational resources, right? So someone gotta put the money, someone gotta put the time, someone gotta bring the ability to operate the business. It's usually GPs, general partners, that bring the time and resources, while LPs provide the money. There are also a few cool tax benefits. Again, I'm not here to give tax advice, but in this case, both LPs and GPs can enjoy pass-through tax benefits as passive investors, allowing for lower taxable liability and more cash in your pocket as a passive investor. And remember, this is for like this video is educational purpose only, right? So consult with your CPA, accountant, all your advisors before making any decisions. But overall, tax benefits are a great perk for both parties involved in syndications. Next, let's talk about controlling a syndication. So many LPs, limited partners, feel uneasy about not having control or voting rights in a deal. But think about it this way. Do you want your pilot asking passengers what to do during like turbulence, for example? No, right? You want to trust the experts, kind of like doctors and pilots. And in a syndication, let the GPs, the general partners do their job, right? Yes, you can vet them. You need to vet them well initially, but then it's on you to also rely on them and hopefully rely on their integrity, their values and skills to make the decision on your behalf. That's the idea of syndications. You find someone, the general partner that you can trust, you put your money with him, but then it's on him to make those decisions so you can stay the passive investor. Let's talk about profits next, because since LPs invest a large portion of the capital, they also receive a significant share of the profits. A very typical structure is an equity split at around 80-20, with the majority going to limited partners as passive investors. They put most of the money, they deserve most of the returns. GPs, general partners, won't receive any money until limited partners get their return first, the predetermined returns, right? And then the remaining profits are then split accordingly based on whatever they decided. In the end, the majority of the profits go to the limited partners, to the passive investors who put most of the money. They put most of the money, they deserve most of the returns. Remember that. So 
Another thing to realize is that when you're out there looking or searching for investment deals or syndication, you'll notice that um, some are only open to accredited investors, while other welcome every non-accredited investors as well. So what does it mean to be an accredited investor? We mentioned that a bit, but I want to go into more of that and also for you to understand the different structures for accredited investors versus not. So when it comes to First of all, just quick recap and reminder on what is accredited investors. The folks in, in, uh, in the SEC, they have some guidelines, right? So to qualify to be an accredited investor, again, you need to have an individual income of at least 200,000 per year for the past two years or a net worth of over 1 million, not counting your primary residence. That means that you're an accredited investor and you're qualified to invest in small business acquisition as an asset class. Now, again, it depends on the structure. We're going to dive into it in a second to understand the different structure that allow accredited versus non-accredited. Now, so you might be wondering if there is a test or a certificate to become an accredited investor. Well, there isn't. The idea is that if you meet this criteria, you're probably financially savvy and can handle the risks of and potential losses of investing in small business. Now, why does the SEC have these rules, you ask? I don't know, but the idea is that they want to protect investors like you. They want to protect investors in general. And it's funny because even though you can gamble in the casino, they limit certain investment opportunities to accredited investors only. It might be frustrating, but that's how it is. But don't worry if you're non-accredited investor because it's like 90% of the population, first of all. You can still get in on some deals. It's just a bit of just a bit harder to find the right opportunities and the right operators that allows that. I'm just curious, what do you think about these roles? Do you do you think they make any sense or do you find them a bit annoying? Just curious with you. Share your thoughts with me. So moving next, for you to understand where can you invest in, you need to be familiar with the regulations under Reg D. And there are two main ones that you should know about. One is the 506C and then there's the 506B. Those are the names, right? So we have, let's start with the regulation 506C. It's for accredited investors only and it allows for unlimited investors. The best part is that the operator can advertise these opportunities, which means that it's just easier for you as a passive investor with a simple Google search to find them. However, if you want to invest, you'll need a third party or a CPA to verify that you're accredited. All right, so they'll need to verify your accredited investor status. It can be a bit of a hassle, but it's necessary. Next, let's discuss the other regulation, which is 506B, or one of the most common regulations, which is for non-accredited investors. Now, finding these deals as a passive investor is a bit trickier since they can't be advertised by the operator, which means that you'll need to build relationships with the operator, right? You'll need to find the right people, you need to find the operator to find these opportunities to invest in. Now, under 506B, operators can accept up to 35 non-accredited investors and unlimited accredited investors in just one deal. Everyone's putting their money under one entity and that entity investing in the business. But they can't advertise on platforms like Facebook or Google. So to participate in these deals, right, as a passive investor, you'll need to have a pre-existing relationship with the operator before the operator can show you any opportunities or any deals to invest in. Now, in here, it's not black or white, it's a bit nuanced and there's gray areas in here, but it's essential to establish the relationship before signing any contract and operators actually usually expect what we call a cooling off period of about a month before soliciting investment. So that means that you might need to engage in a conversation, right? Engage in conversations, phone calls or meetings or attend webinars before you can invest with the operator. So if you're talking to the operator, then they'll want to make sure that you're sophisticated, meaning that basically you understand the risk in the investment and you have the capital to invest, right? And you understand, hey, this is an investment, you can lose your money. After this initial conversation or a webinar or an opportunity, you'll typically wait 30 days before you can see any deal. In the meantime, you can just check their previous deals, right? And see if you like the idea of investing alongside that operator. So that's the workflow for non-accredited investors looking to work with an operator. If an operator isn't following these steps, just be cautious. Now, I want to discuss um, what you might be thinking about. Hey, why 
I mean, why not just do it all on my own? Well, you just need to understand that there's a lot to consider, right? Like, first of all, if even if you want to be active operator or you want to be passive in your investments, like we said, some people have more money than time. Some people have more time than money, right? Like if you're an active or the operator, you also need to understand that you need to imagine getting calls at like 2 a.m. about problems in your business or having to spend your weekends thinking about it nonstop. Does that sound like something you want to do, right? To decide between active and passive investment, you need to consider your personality, your availability, your expertise, and your overall investment and business goals, right? That's one of the key tests you can do with yourself if you want or can be a um, passive or active operator in a deal, right? You can also ask yourself, like, do you enjoy solving problems and juggling like multiple projects? Or do you prefer something more stable and predictable? Do you have the time to dedicate to an active role at all, right? Or is a passive investment better suited for you when you can just put the money and let someone else do the work? Do you even have the money to do that? Or maybe you must invest your time because you don't have the option to be passive investor, right? Obviously, there are benefits of being passive investor, right? And like in my experience, there are four main benefits or advantages, starting with limited risks and responsibilities, because as a passive investor, you don't have to worry about taking on big loans or handling day-to-day -day operations. Um, there's operator expertise. So like, can you execute a big idea? As a passive investor, you can rely on the expertise of the operators that you choose to work with. And they bring the expertise. Um, then there's also alignment of interest. That's the beauty of being a passive investor because the general partners, the GPs, the active people, they only get paid if the limited partners, the passive investors, get paid. This means that they have vested interest in making the business successful. Then I also like the idea of diversification because as a passive investor, you can invest in different asset classes and geographics, but without having to become an expert in each one, right? You just invest in other operators that understand that. So what is it for you? Are you leaning towards active or passive investing? As a passive investor, the most crucial part of your journey is choosing the right partners and the operators that you want to work with. And the way to remember that is to understand that it's pretty much like betting on the jockey, not the horse, right? And a good operator can turn lemons to lemonade, while a bad one might leave a sour taste in your mouth. So you need to be aware of that. Who are the operator you're putting your money with? Do you trust them? Do you like their characters? Do you like their expertise, right? And we can dive in even a bit more to understand the roles and responsibilities in those type of investments. So again, general partners, GPs, the active ones, they go out there, they find deals, they close deals, they run the business, they handle everything except investing the majority of the capital, which comes from the limited partners, from the passive investors. Um, acquisition, business acquisition teams are called kind of like the boots in the ground that get deals under contract. They're putting their, um, sometimes their earnest money at risk. They take the loan guarantee on them. Um, they might find someone else to sign the loan on them, right? Capital raising is where passive investors come into the picture. So operators present the deal. They handle due diligence, they manage investor communications, the asset managers, board of directors, or operational mentors. They do whatever needed to ensure that the business plan is executed. And then their responsibility is to then also send updates to passive investors and to make sure that the financial reporting is happening. So the passive investor get their updates. That's what the active person is doing. As a passive investor, the LPs, you're kind of like a passenger on a plane, like we said, right? So you're enjoying the fruits of others' labors. The asset manager acts as... So as a passive investor, your main task is to understand the structure and responsibilities of each team member so you can make an informed decision about who to trust with your investment and what do you think is the most important aspect of the deal, right? So you look at the operator, you vet him, if the operator is good enough, if you like the deal, you just put the money in the passive investor, he's doing the rest of the work and his responsibility is to send you updates. Next, I want to talk about something that might sound intimidating at first if it's the first time you hear about, which is the capital stack. Uh, but trust me, it's simpler than you think if we just uh, go with it slowly. And a capital stack is just a way to describe how a deal is financed. And the way to understand it is to imagine if you're buying a house, right? So if you're buying a house, let's say you pay 25% down from your money, and let's say the bank gives you 75% loan. In this deal, the capital stack here would be 75% loan or debt financing and 25% equity. But when you deal with more complex investments, there are just other components involved in a deal. The way to look at it is you want to picture kind of like a totem pole that represents who gets paid and in what order. At the bottom of that totem pole is what we call the senior loan. In a business acquisition, many times it's the SBA loan, which is the most secured. 
banks get priority and they must be paid first they have low risk when they put money into deals and that's why they demand lower return now what comes next after that we have what we call common equity but sometimes in between there's mezzanine debt in between it's riskier it doesn't have lien on the property or the business and offers no upside on the deal as mezzanine lender so mezzanine debt holders receive higher return on their interest than senior loans that are at the bottom because it's reflecting their increased risk, right? So we have senior, mezzanine, common. So let's say you get a senior loan at 3% interest rate. Mezzanine, again, numbers now are a bit different, but mezzanine might be around 7%. And debt holders upside is capped, right? They only get that amount. But common equity investors, usually the passive investors, the LPs, have unlimited upside potential. However, they only get paid after everyone below them get paid in the stack, right? Then to add an additional complexity to that, there's what we call preferred equity. Preferred equity is a hybrid between debt and common equity. And the beauty with it is that it provides for passive investors consistent cash flow plus some upside potential. And it's depending if they're just depending on the deal and the operator and whatever the operator is willing to offer to investors. <sighs> So to sum it up, a capital stack can include senior debt, right? That's at the bottom of the totem pole. Then we have mezzanine debt. Then we have preferred equity. Then we have common equity. It's just really good to be familiar with those because when you'll get agreements from operators, you might see some of those terms in there. Now, most deals will probably just have senior debt and maybe common equity. But understanding who gets paid and in what order is crucial right? As well as the risks and potential returns, right? So it's very, very good for you to know that, that in worst case scenarios, if the business is about to collapse, who's get paid first? When you know your position in the stack, you can make more informed decisions about your investment. So it's really good to be familiar with those. Next, let's talk about returns and who gets paid when and how. All right. So first, we need to understand what we call the equity split, which is essentially dividing the pie among all the partners in the deal, right? So for example, we might have an 80-20 split, which is very common, with 80% go to passive investors, the LPs, and 20% go to active individuals, the GPs, the operators, right? But then the real question is, um, if you own 80 or 20%, are you getting the returns that you want? Even if you only own maybe a small percent of the deal, right? So let me share with you what, what I mean by that. So let's say we have 100,000 profit. So using the basic structure, assuming 80-20, 80,000 goes to LPs, 20,000 goes to GPs general partners so 80,000 to the passive 20,000 to uh, the active operators however things get interesting when we introduce preferred returns that we mentioned so LPs get paid first before GPs get paid this means that passive investors need to earn a certain percentage before the operators the GPs get their share so for example if there is an agreement for 7% preferred returns an investor who put in $100,000 need to receive $7,000 first before the GPs, the general partners, the operators get their cut. So all early profits go first to the limited partners and anything above the preferred return is split according to the equity split that was decided in originally. This incentivizes GPs to do a good job and make the deal perform well and make sure that there's alignment. Now, remember the tech capital stack that we talked about? We had senior debt, mezzanine debt, preferred equity, and common equity. Preferred equity and preferred returns get preferential treatment. And the beauty with it is that it's creating alignment of interest between the limited partners and the general partners. Preferred returns help ensure that GPs only get their share if the deal is working. However, it's essential to know that preferred returns are not guaranteed. It means that if there's profits, LPs have the first option to receive the preferred return before GPs get any. So I hope it clearing things out. It creates an amazing alignment of interest where operators are doing most of the work, LPs put in most of the money and therefore deserve most of the returns and operators, the GPs, only get paid if and when the passive investors get paid first creates an amazing alignment of interest when the person with money meets the person with time and the person with time only gets paid if the person with money gets paid first. Next, let's talk about understanding cash flow distribution, right? So cash flow is the operational profit generated on a regular basis from the business. Like, you know, there is monthly profits or quarterly distribution potentially if the business is making enough money and there's agreement for that. So it really comes down to the business revenues minus the expenses and debt service or mortgage. That's the cash flows left pretty much, right? In a simple way. So the cash flow is the way to 
basically see what is the profit after all expenses. And then if there is an agreement in advance, you might be able to get distribution from that. So imagine you invest a significant amount of money in a deal. When you get cash flow distribution, it's gonna be pretty cool. Like they could eventually become your primary source of income if you have enough of those investments. So it's similar to having dividend paying stocks. They can earn you six, 7% just from cash flow. And it's pretty good compared to the stock market. Of course, depends on the deal, depends on if their allowance of distribution of cash flow and if the business uh, bring in enough profits to not put stress on the business if they distribute the money. So it's really cool if there's an opportunity to get distribution with dividend. Next, let's talk about capital events. So first, where can you have capital events? When you sell the business, hopefully it's significant profit. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, right? There's an exit, you sell the business uh, and you have a capital event. Another opportunity is for cash out refinancing, which is an amazing tool as you grow the business to refinance your loan and get access to capital, right? The way to look at it is, again, to put it simply, imagine if you're buying a house for 100,000, maybe you add a bedroom to the house. The house is now worth more because you added the value to the house, right? Just like we do in business operations, we can buy something for 1 million, you can execute our business plan, and then now assuming that everything works well, now it's worth, let's say 1.5 million. After it's worth 1.5 million, because we increased the value, we can go to the bank again and tell them, hey, we want to refinance it at the new valuation. That allows us to then take some equity out of the deal without selling the business. So we still own the business, but we refinanced it for a higher price. We took some money out and de-risk ourselves. So that's another way to have uh, capital events, right? So normally you'd have to wait until the full exit to get the proceeds from the value add. But if you do refinancing, it allows you to basically pull in money in a non-taxable event and allocate it elsewhere. So it's pretty cool. It's kind of like an opportunity to have in your cake and eat in it too. All right, next, I want to move to a term um, called hurdle. And it might sound complex again, but let me break it down for you in simple English. So a hurdle or a back to preferred return idea is basically the benchmark that needs to be reached before a general partner gets paid. So again, let's imagine a deal where there is an 80-20 split between the GPs and LPs, and there is a 7% preferred return. This means that everything behind the 7% will be split 80-20 between the limited partners and the GPs. But hopefully I'm not complicating things too much. But if we wanted to complicate things a bit more, we could say that at, let's say if we reach 10% return, the split become 50-50. Or if we reach the 7% return, the split become 50-50. This is called a waterfall. Because as the deal performs better, GPs take a more favorable split. It makes sense. So basically it means that if we reach a better return for the passive investors, the operator can take a bigger percentage of the upside. Again, there's no black or white rules here. It's literally whatever both sides agree on. I want to add another component to it, which is a catch up. So first, LPs get paid their preferred return, say 7%. Once that's done, GPs will catch up and get their 7% too. After that, profit are split according to the agreed upon percentage, like 80-20 or 50-50 or whatever was agreed on. So that's a catch up. GP makes money. I mean, LP make money. GPs catch up to that. And then there's a split. It's just terms that you want to be familiar with. Again, every operator will have different agreements. You want to see if it's good for you or not. Now, what about dilution or being bought out of the deal? Sometimes contracts state that as you achieve your return, your equity in the deal may be reduced. So that's another option that might happen when you invest in deals. So for example, if you invest 50,000, you might only get a 2x multiple and then you're out of the deal if that's part of the agreement, right? And everything behind that goes to the general partners, the operators. So it's just essential to know about this as well. Um, so you don't end up disappointed because a lot of operators say, hey, if I'll double or triple your money, that's it. You take your money and I'm staying with the deal. And it's very common. You just need to be aware of it if it's out there, right? So in conclusion, um, Understanding these terms will just help you navigate investment deals more effectively. And it's just crucial to know about those things, right? About hurdles, catch-ups, dilution, so you can make informed decision and have a successful investment experience, right? And again, there's no right or wrong on better terms or worse terms. Every operator will decide whatever they want and they might be able to get you as a passive investor or not. You as a passive investor need to figure out if the deal makes sense for you, if you're going to get the returns that you're expecting to get or not. That's what really matters in the end of the day, if you can trust the operator to deliver on the promise. Next, let's explore the different ways of looking at deals and each of them with a unique risk return profile, right? So have you ever wondered like, what are the options? And let me ask you which suits best for you. 
right? So when you're looking at deals, there's a few ways to look at it, right? First of all, it's kind of like a storage of wealth. This approach is more like a hedge against inflation, right? And it's ideal for those who maybe made good money and just want a little yield, like a little small return, right? So think institutional investors, pension funds, they aim sometimes for just stable three, five percent. Next, I want to talk about um, what we call macro view on things, which is I think is super essential to understand as well. When you have an investment strategy, you want to have some kind of a macro view. So what that means, it means that you have few investment strategies. First of all, is to look at things as a buy and hold opportunity. So that's kind of like the old school way. Hey, we take a loan, we pay off mortgage, we let the business cash flow and assume you have a good strategy to operate things. And even if you're not growing things, at least you're sustaining things, you do it long enough and you build appreciation. Other thing is fixing and flipping and renovating and improving things and just quickly selling things. So buy and sell. Next, let's decide on making sure that you're picking the right operator for you to invest in. So imagine you're the passive investor, you're searching for the perfect operator to manage your investment, but how do you make sure it's the right one, right? So I want to make sure that you have the confidence in discovering, vetting, and ultimately selecting the right operator for your needs. So like we said before, you can find them all over the place, networking events, accelerator referrals, you're meeting people in person, you can learn about their personalities and ask them questions and just see them. You want to see them and make sure they're consistent with their message, right? And if you don't like the deals that they offer, then go and find someone else, you know? Look for more opportunities, look for more operators. Enough people look for money, look for the ones that you believe in, right? So as a passive investor, remember your primary responsibility is to vet the people that are gonna manage your money, right? The operator's decisions can make or break a deal. So trust is crucial. You want to make sure that you can trust the person. You want to make sure that he's skilled. Does he know what he's talking about? Did you see him around for a while, right? You want to invest, remember, in the jockey, not just the horse. The horse in this scenario represents the deal, right? It's not just about a deal. It's the jockey that represents the operator, right? So you want combination, a good deal and a good operator. So remember, a few things to consider when you vet operators, their personality, of course. Like, first of all, do you like them? You'll be potentially working with them for years, even if it's just on a passive basis. So make sure that you get along well, even just their vibe. You you don't need to talk to them, but you know, what's the communication with, with them like? Like, will they provide to you updates? Will they be responsive to your questions? Are they around? Do they have a website? Do they have social media presence? Um, do they have skin in the game themselves, right? Do they have track record? So while not necessary because a lot of operators buying the business for the first time, previous experience is always a plus. What about the team? Strong team, like we said, is essential for success when you're investing in deals, right? Also, do they have deep knowledge and problem solving skills? Are they consistent and reliable over time? Can, do you see them as trustworthy, right? So by considering these factors, you'll be able to find the perfect operator for your investment journey. So what do you think is the most important quality in an operator, right? Let me know. See the value in being a passive investor. The biggest challenge of people not getting into investing in small businesses, they either don't have the time or second, I mean, they just don't have access to deals. Well, that's the beauty with syndication, right? Because they can bring you great deals and you don't need to put the time. You literally just see a deal and you put money or you don't. You see the summary and you put money or you don't. With syndications, you don't need to operate anything. So time is no longer a problem, right? And with syndication also, the beauty is that the minimum investment usually starts at 50,000. Let's say you buy a million dollar business. You don't need to put all your money. You can get a group of investors, passive investors like you. Each of you can put 50,000 and then you can buy massive business together. All of you passive investors, you find a great operator and you're good. Then the beauty as a passive investor that I didn't mention actually so far is that the money doesn't necessarily need to come from your like paycheck because a lot of people don't know this, but you can borrow against your life insurance policy and use that to basically use that to invest in deals all while keeping your insurance intact. You can also do self-directed IRA or 401k, right? You can basically invest your retirement funds in alternative assets. All you need is a self-directed IRA and a custodian, right? You can also do home equity loans. So for many people, their home is their most significant asset. What you can do is you can take a loan or line of credit against your home equity and use this to invest passively in opportunities that can provide you great returns over time. So just remember not to, of course, over leverage yourself. And you know, if you use debt to buy other assets, just be careful, okay? Next, let's remind you some um, terms like ROI, which is a return on investment and ROE, return on equity. Because because while ROI is very common and most people are more familiar um, with it, ROE is often overlooked and it's crucial to consider your hidden equity and opportunity cost. And 
Think about it this way. If you buy a $100,000 house in cash, you might get, let's say, 10% return on your equity. But if you use debt, your return on equity could be much better, maybe even 20%, right? Moreover, um, think the equity sitting in your primary residence. You might have a significant amount of equity just sitting there, not working for you. So if you could take that capital out and redeploy it, you can make much more money. It's something to really, really think about where your money is sitting and, and is not being used anywhere. So what about you? Are you sitting on tons of equity in your home maybe or in an old retirement account that can be redeployed somewhere else? Don't let the I don't have money excuse hold you back from becoming a passive investor. So take a moment and think about your return on equity and your opportunity cost, right? Like where would your equity be more effective? Always consider these factors when making an investment decisions. And who knows, you might just find the key to really find the great best deal for you to get like one good investment can really change the trajectory of your life. So being aware of your opportunity cost and investment can be really, really key practice that you can have, which lead me to talking about key investment metrics. So let me tell you a story about some important investment metrics that can really help you make better decisions when it comes to your hard earned money. Okay, so imagine that you're looking at a potential investment and you want to know how profitable it could be. In that case, a term you might want to be familiar with is cash on cash metric. That's where it comes in. So cash on cash metric, it measures the cash flow from operations compared to your initial investment, which is crucial for those looking to general income today. Okay, next, another term you want to be familiar with is your average annual return or AAR. This metric takes all distributions in the deal, so cash flow, refinancing, exit proceeds, and any other profits, and divides it by the number of years that you're invested. It just gives you a good idea of how much you could potentially earn each year. So an operator might show you the opportunity when it comes to those terms. So it's always good to be familiar with those. So if someone is telling you, hey, this is the expected um, cash on cash or IRR or ARR, it's really good. But what if I told you there's a fancier way to calculate AAR, which is um, what we call uh, IRR, internal rate of return. These metrics considers the timing of when you receive your money because a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. Right? So just another way to calculate your yearly return in a fancy way. That's pretty much it. Another important metric uh, for you to know about is the equity multiple. So this one just tells you how many times you've multiplied your money in an investment. To calculate it, you just divide your total distributions by your initial investment. Is a higher multiple better here? Well, it depends on how long the deal is, right? Um, now, let me um, also get you familiar with another term, which is the rule of 72. The rule 72, it's an easy way to estimate how long it will take for your money to double. And the way you do this, you just divide 72 by the interest rate that you expect to earn on, you basically get the number of years it will take to double your investment. And this is another cool way to look at things. And finally, um, let's talk about preferred returns. So these metrics, uh, which we already talked about a bit, it just puts passive investors in the first position to get paid, ensuring that active investors or general partners meet a specific return before taking their share of the profit themselves, right? So it's just a great way, like we said, to align interest and protect the passive investor. If you don't have preferred returns in your deal, just be cautious because it might be uh, that you're not aligned with the operator. So next time you're considering an investment, just remember this metric. They can help you make more informed decisions and understand the potential returns of each deal. Next, let's talk about the interest rate or just interest rate in general. Interest rate is the annual rate that you pay for a loan. Now, sure, lower rate uh, seems better, but without understanding the full picture, it might not be, right? So the term is super important to, to understand. So commercial loans have what we call an amortized period, but the loan matures earlier. So if you have a 30-year loan with a 10-year term, you have a big balloon payment during 10 years. So I'm talking to you about those terms because you might want to be prepared for that or it could just cause problems if the operator is not familiar with that, right? Another thing you want to be familiar with if the operator is taking a loan is what we call payment penalties. So banks don't want you to sell early. So what they do is they give you, they add penalties to protect themselves on the loan. You'll usually see this in what we call a step-down method based on when you sell the deal, assuming that there's a loan. So also you might see an interest only period. It can also be helpful for the operator, which means the operator only pay interest for a certain time, usually at least a year, which keeps cash flow high in the early years. So it's nice to have, but not a must. Um, another thing you want to be familiar with is uh, LTV, loan to value. It's the loan balance relative to the purchase price. In the financial crisis, for example, people took on too much debt, sometimes 100% or more, 
Um, now banks look for 70, 80% LTV um, loan to value to have a nicer buffer. Another one you want to be familiar with is DSCR, which is debt service coverage ratio. It's critical term to understand. Um, banks, they want to see enough income to cover their loan payments. So they usually want to see 1.5x the loan payment in net income from the business. So as a passive investor, this is what operators should be considering. So always when you hear an operator taking a loan, just make sure that there's enough cushion there and there's not too much stress on the business if they're taking a loan. So just be familiar with those terms. I went through a lot of them real quick. Again, you don't need to be an expert in them. Just know that they exist. Know that when an operator is asking you for money, know that you want him to be familiar with those. So there's not too much stress on the business because a lot of operators use debt and it's very normal. It's essential when it comes to investing as banks often bring 75 or more of the deal. So as passive investors, you don't need to worry about personal relationship with the banks or guaranteeing the loan, but understanding those terms can be helpful because the operator will do all that work to bring the loan, to take the loan, to sign the guarantee, to negotiate the terms, right? You just want to be sure that he's aware of it and you're aware of it. And there are different aspects to consider. Like we said, the interest rate, the terms, the prepayment penalties, which lead me to one crucial factor, which is understanding whether a loan is recourse or non-recourse. Because with non-recourse loans, your personal assets are generally not on the line, which is great advantage. But if you see an operator taking a loan, it might be a good advantage for you to see that he's putting a guarantee and have a downside, right? So just again, just things to be aware of. As a passive investor, you should be aware of the steps involved from when a deal comes to you until it closes. And operators usually filter through so many deals themselves. Remember, they submit they look at many deals, they submit an offer, an LOI, and then they negotiate a purchase price and sells an, purchase, an uh, purchase sales agreement. Right? During this time, the operator might start to talk to you as a passive investor to tease you into coming into the potential deal. So there's going to be a due diligence to buy the business, and it's an essential step to uncover any issue that might import impact closing. Once everything checks out, the operator then presents the deal to you, the investors, through what we call a marketing page, package or a pitch deck. If you're considering investing, you then move to you need to move quickly, right? Because opportunities can be scarce and the deal needs to be closed. So then the operator might do a webinar, usually held, let's say within the first week, then legal documents he'll send over. After that, once you've wired the funds after that, you're officially in the deal. At this point, you can sit back, you wait to update from the operators and you're good to go. So remember, during that period, a lot of unexpected things and delays can happen. It's very normal, but that's not necessarily any red flag. So just be patient. When the operator is presenting the deal, just know that lawyers are going to be involved. It might take more time than you think. So again, operators will go out there. They'll find deals. They'll make offers. In the meantime, they'll pitch you. There's going to be due diligence. You'll need to send the money. They'll close the deal and then you'll get updates and your distribution. So when operator is talking to you, they're going to send you uh, investment offerings or decks. Those are what you'll receive from the operator when they have a deal in the pipeline and ready to raise capital. So you will get it in an email and it's up to you to decide whether you want to invest or pass, right? But how do you then make the decision quickly? Well, let's break it down, right? Like what do you want to see in a pitch deck to make a decision if you want to invest? So in those investment decks, also known as pitch decks or deal decks or marketing packages or whatever, they come in various shapes and sizes. The information and design may, may be different, but the goal is to just basically help you as a passive investor make an informed decision. So typically in those pitch decks, you'll see things like, first of all, the disclaimer on investors that are invited to the deal, if it's accredited or not. You'll see the deal outline and executive summary. You'll see investment highlights. You'll see and understand the equity split, if it's preferred returns or not, and the earning projections. You'll see hopefully a business plan, some kind of uh, understanding of who in the team, market info, uh, minimum and maximum investment amounts. You'll see return assumptions. Uh, financials of the business, info on the next steps, and what's the step to wiring the funds, uh, and of course, contact information to the operator. So you'll probably be sent a lot of those deals if you work with a lot of operators, which will then lead you, if you like the deal, to what we call a PPM and a private placement memorandum, which is then the dense legal document. Uh, understanding it is very important, because you'll get the PPM before signing a deal and it will contain more detailed info on the team, on the compensation, on taxes and the deal itself. And it's essential to find a lawyer and CPA familiar with private placement to help you to review it, right? It's very good to have one. So a PPM can have sometimes 70, 100 pages long and include info on share price, on the minimum offering amounts, on the regulation exemptions, on the risk, on the uh, definitions of different terms of 
uh, the sources of proceeds on investment objectives, allocation, distribution rules, fees, conflict of interest, limited liability rules, and risk factors. So there's a lot to digest in the PPM, but remember that the PPM is there to protect you as an investor. So while understanding the risk is important, don't let them scare you away from investing because with the right support from a lawyer and CPA, you'll be better equipped to make informed decisions. And it's very common to see long documents with scary uh, text in there. It's just a way to protect you, right? So remember, first you'll see a pitch deck, then you'll show your interest. If you're ready to invest, you'll get a PPM, which is the official legal document, which you can then go and use to move to the next step, which is to sign and wire your money. Assuming you invested in the money, awesome, right? Then you might be wondering, cool, what's next? Well, the beauty is that as a passive investor, you don't really have much to do after you send the money, right? It's pretty much that simple. Like you won't be checking your investment, or business like a stock market account every day. They are private investment, so communication may be slower, but like, don't worry, you'll still get updates um, every now and then. You might get more initial communication after the closing, and then some kind of a periodic updates, right? Expect at least, hopefully, to get at least quarterly um, updates, maybe sometimes monthly, depending on the operator. Now, remember, this is when being passive investor is all about. It's being patient. It's collecting paychecks, but without doing much. So you might be triggered if you never did it before, but understand that that's the case, right? You just put the money and that's it. And then you wait and hope for the best. Um, the value of your shares, like you want to know what your shares are worth at real time, right? You'll see growth, hopefully, or see capital events at an exit. You might see cash flow distribution if it's quarterly at all or nothing at all. Um, and then if there's distribution, you'll just get an update and uh, they'll be sent to your bank account. Now, sometimes you'll hear an operator about talking about refinancing, which can be a nice chunk of money coming your way if they decide to do that. Other times, you might experience uh, what we call a capital call because sometimes the deal needs more capital and it could be part of the original plan or sometimes they're unexpected events. So just know that it's possible that they might ask for more money from sovereign the investors. If you don't want to invest, uh, it's okay. Your shares just might be diluted if they raise another round. It's very common. Also, uh, just expect that at the beginning of each year, you also receive what we call a K-1 um, for tax purposes. Then it's basically back to finding another deal or creator to invest in. After all, being a passive investor is all about enjoying the ride and letting your investment work for you without doing the day-to-day -day operation, which is pretty cool. It's a really nice adventure. You help entrepreneurs, you save jobs, you create jobs, hopefully in a sector that you like or uh, want to be part of. All right, my friend. So we've pretty much reached the finish line. Um, now it's time to put all that knowledge into action. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Feel free to join our mailing list to receive updates on our offerings if you want to see our um, deals and syndications. Um, and we can help you find operators that come through our community that we would uh, like to syndicate deals to. And we can help you explore deals and just get comfortable with analyzing deals and making decisions on, on, on operators that we're going to present from our community. And remember, knowledge alone is in power, right? It's what you do with it that counts. So go out there, implement what you've learned, find deals, start building your passive investment streams with small business acquisitions, find operators, come to us, just be part of the list, see the deals that we're looking at. And if at some point you want to decide to invest, of course, we'll be more than happy. Um, if not, I'm wishing you the best. Go out there and find more deals and really share the word about investing in small business acquisitions. The returns are great. The impact that we can create in communities and saving jobs and creating jobs are great. And it's just a win-win for everyone. So I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below what you thought about if, if you are still here. And I'm um, looking forward to seeing you in the future. Take care.